we'll uh, move over to our next presenter here, uh, Phil. He's going to be giving us a kind of an update of the overall Helix core and talk about all the work that's been done over the last uh, last year to improve it. All right. Well, it's a bit of a tough act to follow when uh, you're presenting code changes versus a, a very nice uh, user application with nice graphs and other things like that. So we'll do what we can here. Uh, let's see, you should be seeing my screen or a blank just a, screen. Just a blank screen now, yeah. Right. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to talk about is the story of Helix development over the last few years under the Helix Plus project and how we, we moved from the, the end of the Helix, the TDNC development project, which originally developed Helix, to the, the Helix Plus project here and kind of moving through the code and kind of finishing up the core development of Helix through the project. Uh, what I want to start with is kind of the design philosophy of Helix. So. Helix had as one of its goals to make it as easy as possible for federates of all kinds to work together. And I think that's reflected in the, the tagline we picked for our logo, which simulations are better together. And the design philosophy of Helix tries to embody that in how we develop the code, how we add on things, what features we add, which features we don't add, and how we make it work together. And so if you can read through these, um, basically the idea is we want federates to be their own. We want federates to have their own uh, guidelines to be able to run with or without Helix, and to be able to do so and be able to connect to other federates, other components, other software tools in as easy a manner as possible. And we also want the code to work well, to be layered, well designed, well architected, well tested, and to minimize the central control so that allows scalability because we want to be able to do large scale infrastructure co-simulation, which is embodied in the, the acronym which came to be Helix. So through this project, uh, there's been kind of a wide number of phases. Uh, we started off with a little bit of a backlog of bug fixes and other things, and we took the time to go through a serious code review. So this looked at the API, looking at it in detail, figuring out what can be improved, what can be changed, what wasn't working, what was, and then going through some of the core library and how the the library was actually structured and making recommendations for that. And we use these recommendations to guide the Helix 3 uh, version release and the changes we used in there. But to start off, there was some uh, kind of underlying cleanup that needed to be done, uh, adding a number of continuous integration checks, adding debugging, because people were starting to use Helix at a much higher level. Uh, when we get into the fall and winter, Got to check my spelling, apparently. Uh, but uh, in the fall and winter of 2021, uh, we got the first release of 3.0. This updated the serialization protocol for performance. Um, we used a lot of the code review for the API and changed a lot of things based on that. Uh, targeted endpoints were a new feature to allow much more flexibility and control of messages and the associated timing. Under Helix, the command interface was a way to allow federates to interact with each other and um, provide instructions to each other on an asynchronous basis. And then there was some a pretty massive rework of the the continuous integration systems, as that's a continually evolving, evolving uh, change in the uh, open source community. In the spring and summer of 2021, we get to version release 3.0, and that was kind of a long slog to actually get through. But uh, there was a lot of renamings and a lot of change and a bit of a learning curve to figure out how people, how to get people to change, what needed to be fixed, what needed to be stabilized. And incorporated with that, we also released a 2.8 version, which is the the latest release on the 2 series, which some people are still using, but that included a forward compatibility layer with 3.0 and introduced several usability features, which came out pretty early in the project from Trevor's work on the usability phase, basically adding a profiling capability so we can understand which parts of the Federation are slowing it down, how much time is actually spent in Helix, how much time is spent in the different applications, and which ones are actually blocking. 
And this is quite useful for uh, improving the performance of co-simulation. And then likewise, time barriers and remote logging allow a debugging capability within Helix itself. So you can stop, stop co-simulations, take a look, and combined with some of the query features allows you to interact with a running co-simulation, get the information out of it, figure out what if anything is going wrong and where things are behaving particularly uh, useful, the bigger the co-simulation gets. We get to version 3.1, and this is where we consider the three version mostly stable, but we added observer federates, which are, are ways to join a running co-simulation and observe things about them. And this was the first step in adding dynamic federations. Um, a number of new automatic code checkers, which always uh, is a little bit challenging for a while because you see a whole bunch of different things going wrong. And then new diagnostics and timeout. And this is all in cl close collaboration with the usability team um, and how we worked with the different language APIs and adding some features for those, adding and watching our user base as to how they are using Helix and what struggles they are having and trying to address some of those that we can on the internal basis. Version 3.2 added a translator layer, and this really came out of the domain API work that Trevor was also leading, uh, as well as some of the data APIs. Um, this is a way to connect messages or message interfaces to value interfaces. And this became particularly important when we're talking about uh, adding in things such as regulators, which you may want to send a message to, but they actually interact on a value basis. So instead of having them have to be able to translate all these messages, the translator feature allows that to be built external to those models and controlled independently of it, but still have the ability to interact back and forth between the value and message interfaces in Helix. The REST API really came from uh, some users starting to use Helix on a web server or wanting to be able to interact it with it through a microservice or other types of actions, which are becoming much more prevalent in, in cloud-based operations. And encryption features came from another uh, uh, user application. So we're being able to add in features that are driven by different applications. Uh, version 3.3, now we're getting into the time since the last uh, user group meeting, but there was a lot of bug fixes going on. Uh, as, as you might expect, as people increase the use of Helix, they find the edge cases, they find the little, little features that we weren't able to test and little timing issues and those all needed to be fixed. Uh, we added an asynchronous time coordinator, and this was to support some particular use cases that were predominantly driven by wall clock time. And so the... Uh, timing synchronization that is native in Helix was not was slowing things down or making things unnecessarily complex. Alias features, which allow you to rename certain things independently. So if there's a long complex name that gets generated and you want a simple one, aliases allow you to do that. And this was also driven by some of the domain API work. Uh, a global time coordinator, there's particular instances where it just makes sense to have everything coordinated by a single location. And so that's the purpose of the global time coordinator. So we wanted to give options and to different users of this. Uh, the callback federate allows very tiny federates to be used at scale. And this is what's allowing us to get up to the very large scale numbers into the millions of federates. Uh, so you can define a federate that works um, um, on a callback basis, and this is really similar to what Mosaic is using, and we're learning from the other different co-simulation tools that are out there and, and collaborating on, on what works best and what we can learn from each other. Uh, the initialization iteration, there were some use cases in the domain API where you didn't, where you wanted to be able to connect or define what you publish based on what everybody else is doing. And the initialization iteration allows you to do that in the initialization step. So you can define a breakpoint uh, loop and then check what everybody else is doing and then only then define your interfaces. And this uh, is a performance issue and minimizes the uh, complexity of the, of the system. And then we're working towards a full dynamic federation, which we'll get to in the next version. But this is to support some of the originally designed use cases for 
uh, for Helix that were way back uh, when Helix was first started. Uh, finally, we get to version 3.4, and this includes a number of additional bug fixes and full dynamic federation. So now we can add uh, add new components as the federation is going on. Uh, the use case for that might be electric vehicles. So I have a vehicle going around. It's not connected to the grid, but suddenly it connects uh, later on or new generators coming online or new parts of the grid or adding different components as the co-simulation is flowing. And so we can be able to add these, take them away and do different things with this. And so this is kind of one of the last use cases that we hadn't been able to support in Helix until now. Uh, related to that is the use of uh, regex connections. So this is for debugging, but it basically allows you to, um, if you don't know the name or you want to connect to a whole bunch of different things, uh, you can use uh, regex expressions to uh, simplify the connection significantly. Um, Along with that, we've done some automatic uh, kind of workflow generation and the data sync interface, which is just kind of a convenience tool for doing some debugging. And what we consider with 3.4 is all the different use cases that were originally designed. We think we can support them all now. Um, and so that that's kind of a great feeling to be able to know that our original design from six years ago, we think we can do everything in it now that we had put into the design of Helix. So what's next? Um, some of the most of these we have kind of designs in place and planned out and some code put in place, but they're not in Helix yet. And the priority will kind of depend on uh, additional funding or whatever um, other projects. Going. But we're looking at some performance improvements, uh, namely uh, moving to single thread cores. There's a lot of a, a majority of the use cases of Helix are single core versus federate. Um, and so being able to optimize the performance under that mode would seem to be a an easy win or a, a win for performance, not necessarily an easy one, but uh, we're getting there. And then some testing on some of the additional interfaces uh, to improve those for, for performance reasons or just uh, testing out different um, scales of operation. And then the mesh networking is another performance improvement we think will will make a big difference in some use cases that are exchanging a lot of data and complex patterns. Uh, we're looking at compatibility with some of the scientific HPC based tools, uh, it's the XSDK, and then updating the Java interface and then one design on a RPC based federate that would allow you to communicate um, uh, completely independently outside of the uh, Helix library even. And plug-in networking would allow uh, communication under very specialized conditions, uh, probably most applicable in some uh, hardware in the loop applications where you have a dedicated high-speed network of some kind that would need, need the performance. And then eventually we want to get to tag-based connections, so allowing you to make the connections in Helix based on metadata that is provided with each of the individual interfaces and to take the observer app that is now part of the Python Federation, but we think we can get additional performance and capabilities by migrating that directly into Helix and associating it with the other applications. And so the whole purpose of this is we want Helix to be easy to work with and really to make simulations work better together and make simulations are better together. And that is the, the idea and hopefully we're are making progress on that, and I think we've made a lot of progress on that um, in the core development uh, task on this project. So, if there's any questions on specific features um, or other parts of Helix on the code, happy to answer anything you have, any questions you may have. Well, it's, it's fantastic work, and I would absolutely buy the T-shirt uh, that has uh, the tagline and the logo on it. That's That's for <laughs> sure. I guess maybe we need a store. We need we need the Helix uh, storefront on this thing, but it's like so. It's it really is uh, kind kind of rare is for all the things that you wanted to do that that you envisioned that you could do with Helix um, was pretty much you can do, and so that's that's a, a a tremendous validation of the of the collective work and the ability to hold towards the original course on it. So I'm. I'm really happy. I, I know it's hard to follow the beautiful the beautiful interface with code updates and stuff like that. But <laughs> it is it is fantastic work. Um, 
and, uh, and, and, you know, my, my next goal or the goal that I've been sort of holding to is to, to infect the, the next group of people I'm working with, which is a lot of vehicle stuff with, with the Helix uh, co-simulation environment as well. So I'll, I'll keep flying the flag. This has been a very exciting group to work with, and there is no chance we could have done this on our own, so. Awesome, thanks, Phil. Of course, Chris, you teed up for uh, next week, which will be on transportation and distribution models, so. Wow. We have any we have about uh, maybe about five or six minutes here for follow up questions for Phil. Any questions about uh, the new version of Helix or about some of the history or design specifications that we push through? I, I guess I'll put I'll put one question out there and I think I may have asked a version of it before, but looking at you know the observer function and uh, the ability to sort of lightly orchestrate uh, the interactions is, you know, one of the things that that you know, I probably drove uh, poor Phil to distraction on in uh, in in the center point project was um, how can we how can we sense increasing interdependencies? So we put you know a transportation simulation, a comm simulation, and a power simulation together, and and you know and they they exchange determinants and things like that. Um, is there is there anything in the in the observer function at the center of the web where because of either the intensity of the of the interactions through the helix interface or the dynamics of the interface across helix that you can sense where interdependencies are more intense or less intense Or is it just not, getting math to work and there's not really a, a good correlation there? I would say the core layers of Helix don't barely deal in the math itself. Mm -hmm. um, what the observer we're building in Helix would allow is you to put additional functionality on top of that. Mm -hmm. So if you knew the numerics of something and you wanted to watch how fast things were changing at different boundaries, uh, that is something the observer federate would be able to give you the data to feed into something like that. And then you so could it, even put that in a different monitor federate. So it'd almost be like a like a a gradient or something that allows you to say it's like these two simulations are are having they're taking a long time to settle so it's either there's a there's a defect in the math and the way that they talk or that their dynamics are feeding on each other and each each incremental change produces another reaction and another another computational sequence in the other so it's just but it's it's as we get all these things connected together um, it's just an, an interesting thing to try and put our fingers on yeah I think some of the work that was presented last week on the convergence applications sounds very similar to what you're talking about as well. I, I think that there's probably a way to to use that because I think convergence is is an indicator of, of either persistent dynamics or persistent issues. I agree. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, and I think that's right, Chris. I think, you know, we go in with certain assumptions about how interconnected these simulations are. And then I think the observer function allows us to observe that and say, well, maybe maybe these aren't as connected as we thought, or maybe they um, maybe are even more connected than we thought in some cases. So you can use that as a way to, in the future, modify your simulations and get uh, more efficiencies out of them, or even have greater understanding about how what the interactions are. Uh, one point I wanted to add, so Adil here, by the way, uh, presented the work last week. So in my work, I did have these kind of, exactly what you're talking about. So if there is a divergence on one of the uh, uh, one of the subscriptions, for example, I have warnings that that let me know that this is where where the issue is essentially. So you definitely can use the observer filter for these kind of stuff. Thank you. And then um, Phil, there are some, there's kind of a little bit of chat going on about translator documentation. I don't know if you can 
Uh, um, jump in there. Uh, let's see, where is the chat? So the question was, um, are features like translators in Helix, are they in the user's guide or where are they, I guess, made the more general uh, questions? They are. There's usually a page on it. Sometimes the um, link into the user's guide lags a little bit behind that. But I believe if you search for that, you can find the information on the translators. Uh, Trevor, do you know if that's linked directly in there? Yeah, I'm not seeing a page. I felt like we did that, but uh, you know, proof is in the pudding. If I can't find it, then it, it probably didn't happen. Well, there we go. We got an assignment for the next next couple weeks there. That means that was a really good question. It found a found a hole for us. Any additional questions? Any? Well, if not, then uh, I'll just want to say thank you, Phil, for another great presentation on, on the background and the, the strengths of Helix here. Uh, thank you to Anantha for our for his earlier presentation also, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your uh, morning today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.